Chapter 3 Camp on the High Prairie Pa made camp as usual. First, he unhitched the and unharnessed Pet and Patty, and he put them in their picket line. Picket lines were long ropes fastened to iron pegs driven into the ground, and the pegs were called picket pins. When horses were on picket lines, they could eat all the grass, and the long ropes would let them reach. But when Pet and Patty were put on them, the first thing they did was lie down and roll back and forth and over. They rolled until the filling of the harness was all gone from their backs. While Pet and Patty were rolling, Paul pulled all the grass from a large round space of ground. There was old dead grass at the roots of the green grass, and Pa could take no chance of settling, setting a prairie on fire. If fire once started in that dry undergrass, it would sweep that whole country bare and black, Pa said. Best be on safe side. It saves trouble in the end. When the space was clear of grass, Paul laid a handful of dry grass in its center. From the creek's bottoms, he brought an armful of twigs and dead wood. He laid small twigs, larger twigs, and then the wood on a handful of dry grass. He lighted the grass and the fire crackled merrily inside the ring of bare ground that it wouldn't get out of. When Pa brought water from the creek while Mary and Laura helped Ma get supper, Ma measured coffee beans into the coffee pot with the water Pa had brought, and Ma set a pot in the coals. She set it on the iron-baked oven in the coals, too. While it heated, she mixed cornmeal and salt with water and patted it into little cakes. She greased the baked oven with a pork rind and laid the cornmeal cakes in it and put it on the iron cover. When Pa raked more coals, over the cover while Ma sliced fat salt pork. She fried slices in the iron spider. The spider had short legs to stand on in the coals, and that is why it's called a spider. If it had had no legs, it would have been a frying pan. The coffee boiled and the cakes baked and the meat fried, and they all smelled so good that Laura grew hungrier and hungrier. Pa set the wagon seat near the fire. He and Ma sat on it. Mary and Laura sat on the wagon tongue. Each of them had a tin plate and a steel knife and a steel fork with white bone handles. Ma had a tin cup, and Pa had a tin cup, and baby Carrie had a little one of her own. But Mary and Laura had to share their tin cup. They drank water, and they could not drink coffee until they grew up. While they were eating supper, the purple shadows closed around the campfire, and the vast prairie was dark and still. Only the wind moved steadily through the grass, and large, low stars hung glittering from the great sky. The campfire was cozy in the big chill darkness, and the slices of pork were crispy, and the fat, the corn cakes were good. In the dark beyond the wagon, Pitt and Patty were eating, too. They bit off bites of grass with sharp, crunching sounds. 
We'll camp here a day or two, said Pa. Maybe we'll stay here. There's good land, timber in the bottoms, plenty of game, everything a man could want. What do you say, Caroline? We might go further and fare worse, Ma replied. Anyway, I'll look around tomorrow, said Pa. I'll take my gun and get us some good fresh meat. He lighted his pipe with a hot coal and stretched out his legs comfortably. The warm brown smell of tobacco smoke mixed with the warmth of the fire. Mary yawned and <gasps> slid off the wagon tongue to sit on the grass. Laura yawned too. Ma quickly washed the tin plates the tin cups, the knives, and the forks. And she washed the baked oven and the spider and rinsed the dishcloth. For an instant, she was still, listening, long, welling howls from the dark prairie. They all knew what it was, but that sound always rang cold over Laura's backbone and crinkled over the back of her head. Ma shook the dishcloth, and then she walked into the dark and spread the cloth on the tall grass to dry. When she came back, Pa said, Wolves, half a mile away, I judge. Well, there's deer. There will be wolves. I wish. He didn't say what he wished. But Laura knew he wished Jack was there. When wolves howling in the big woods, Laura had always known that Jack would not let them hurt her. A lump swelled hard in her throat, and her nose smarted. She wrinkled fast and did not cry. That wolf, or perhaps another wolf, howling again. Bedtime, girls. Bedtime for little girls, Ma said cheerfully. Mary got up and turned around so that Ma could unbutton her, but Laura jumped up and stood still. She saw something deep in the dark beyond the firelight. Two green lights were shining near the ground. They were eyes. Cold ran over Laura's backbone. Her scalp crinkled and her hair stood up. The green lights moved. One winked out, and the other winked out, and then both shone steadily, coming nearer. Look, Pa, look, Laura said. A wolf! Pa did not seem to move quickly, but he did. In an instant, he took his gun out of the wagon, and he was ready to fire at those green eyes. The eyes stopped coming. They were still in the dark, looking at him. It can't be a wolf, unless it's a mad wolf, Pa said. Ma lifted Mary into the wagon. And it's not that, said Pa. Listen to the horses. Pet and Patty are still biting off bits of grass. A lynx, said Ma. Or a coyote? Pa picked up a stick of wood, and he shouted and threw it. Green eyes went close to the ground as if the animal crouched to spring. Pa felt the gun ready. The creature did not move. Don't, Charles, Ma said. But Pa slowly walked towards those eyes, and slowly along the ground the eyes crawled towards him. Laura could see the animal in the edge of the dark. It was a tawny animal. Brindle. And then Pa shouted, and Laura screamed. The next thing she knew, she was trying to hug, jumping, panting, wiggling Jack, who le leaped into her hands with his warm, wet tongue. She couldn't hold him. He leaped, and he wiggled from her to Pa to Ma and back to her again. Well, I'm beat, Pa said. So am I, said Ma. But did you have to wake the baby? She rocked Carrie in her arms, hushing her. 
Jack was perfectly well, but soon he laid down close to Laura and sighed a long sigh. His eyes were red with tiredness, and all the underparts of him were caked with mud. Ma gave him a corn cake, and he licked it and wagged politely, but he could not eat. He was too tired. No telling how long he kept swimming, Pa said, nor how far he was carried downstream before he landed. And then at last he reached them. Laura called him a wolf, and Pa threatened to shoot him. But Jack knew that they didn't mean it. Laura asked him, You knew we didn't mean it, didn't you, Jack? Jack wagged his stump of a tail, and he knew. He was, it was past bedtime. Pa chimed, chained Pet and Patty to the feed box at the back of the wagon and fed them their corn. Carrie slept again, and Ma helped Mary and Laura undress. She put them in their long nightgowns over their heads while they stuck their arms into the sleeves. They buttoned the neckbands themselves and tied the strings of their nightcaps beneath their chins. Under the wagon, Jack wearily turned around three times and laid down to sleep. In the wagon, Laura and Mary said their prayers and crawled into their little bed. Ma kissed them goodnight. On the other side of the canvas, Pet and Patty were eating their corn, while Patty whooshed in the feed box. The whoosh was right at Laura's ear. There were little scurry sounds in the grass and the trees by the creek. The owl called, Hoo! Hoo! And further away, another owl answered, Hoo! Hoo! Far away on the prairie, the wolves howled, and under the wagon, Jack growled low in his chest. In the wagon, everything was safe and snug. Thickly in front of the open wagon top hung a large glittering stars. Pa could reach them. Laura thought she wished he would pick the biggest one from the thread on which it hung from the sky and give it to her. She was wide awake and she was not sleepy at all. But suddenly she was very much surprised. The large star winked at her, and then she was waking up the next morning. Tune in next time for more of the story of Little House on the Prairie. Have a great day. Bye.